Yes, please be seated. Good morning. We're here for oral argument. Is it Azure? Agar? Azure. Agar. Azure versus a better today. Um, as you may, as you may know, we um, both record and live stream the proceedings this morning. So please give your full name and the name of your client before you begin. Um, our current protocol: you'll each be arguing from the um, podium near the council table. You'll have a maximum of 20 minutes per side. Although you're not required to use all of your time, we do require you to keep track of your own time and the clocks on the podium reflect those totals, including any amount of time you'd like to reserve. I will try to give you some signposts. Please keep in mind that before oral argument this morning, we have read all of the briefing, studied the record, and discussed the case in conference. Um, and Mr. Sampson, you may proceed. May it please the court, Mark Sampson of Keller Rohrbach for the appellant Angelique Ager. This is, as we just saw you dealing with, a premises case. And it comes up on summary judgment having been granted to the defendant business um, at a time when expert discovery, unlike the last case, had not yet uh, had the deadlines pass. But the trial court's order is somewhat in unusual because he held clearly that gravel can be dangerous but then found as a matter of law that this gravel for this patient was not unreasonably dangerous. That's where we believe the error is in his decision. Um, and he based that finding, at least in his written order, primarily on the fact that there had not been any earlier falls on the gravel at the Willow House. Um, if we look at the history, and you read the briefs, both sides have dealt with it, um, about gravel cases at the appellate court level in Arizona, uh, they don't fit this very well. Um, the one thing that they do prove is that gravel is not usually as a matter of law, not dangerous or unreasonably dangerous. Because if you look at it, um, those cases, there was either evidence that the plaintiff saw the gravel, decided to encounter it, uh, and that's in the Neptune's Table case, Hagen, and also in Jackson v. Cartwright School District, the softball attendee who, with a concrete ramp that had debris, gravel on it, had already complained at earlier games to the Little League Association about the danger of the ramp, and then proceeded to go on it and fell. So those are not here. Uh, the other cases had evidence that the business owners were patrolling for gravels and stones on the walkways around their business. That's the Price case, the Sambo's restaurant case, and that's 20 years ago. Before this fall, um, they had a program of looking for gravel on hard surfaces and keeping it away from their customers. Um, and also the same Tenet was followed in the McGuire case, Valley National Bank building, which was 40 years ago, in which the patrolling, and in the McGuire case, a, a, a janitor left so little time for the gravel, the debris to have been in place that it wasn't unreasonable not to find it. You don't have to find that kind of a hazard every five minutes. But that doesn't 
apply here because the undisputed evidence from Gail, the fellow patient who saw Ms. Ager fall, was that she'd been at Willow House for 20 days and the gravel was always on the driveway. And the Willow House manager admitted at deposition they didn't have any sweeping program that she knew of to address the gravel on the driveway until after the fall, as you saw from the briefing. Um, and then the final earlier gravel case is the Sanders case, which is um, the amusing one about the social friend who goes out while he's at his friend's house, he drives past in the daylight at least two times an 18 inch high, four feet wide pile of gravel on the, on the outdoors of his neighbor's house. They go out, have dinner. Mr. Sanders gets pretty toasted, comes back and falls over the gravel pit. So on a bunch of grounds, the court found that gravel to that person not a problem. Ms. Ager doesn't fit any of those scenarios. The uncontested facts showed that she had no choice to be at Willow House that day. She'd been committed for rehab by her family. ABT told her where to be, transported her, and so that day, she had never been to Willow House before. She lived at another of its facilities. The van picked her up, drove to Willow House to pick up another passenger. She got out of the a passenger door to go around and help load the luggage because the other passenger was going to be moving and never saw the gravel never had been on that, so she knew about the gravel like Gail, the other patient, did. And the danger in gravel, we'll talk about in a sec, it's not per se dangerous as uh, defendants raised in their briefing. The gravel where it was in the landscaped area, if it's on dirt, it's not hazardous because it can't slide. It's when gravel and sand and lots and leaves, debris, get on hard surfaces that they become dangerous. And as she was walking around to the back of the van, her foot hits the gravel, slid out from under her, down she went, and as you saw from the briefing, blew apart a recent knee repair and ended up needing three surgeries. So she certainly wasn't like the Neptune's table person who saw it and decided, OK, I'm going to try it, or the Cartwright Schools person who'd already complained about it and obviously knew about it. Nor did the evidence show that it fits the Preuss or McGuire case because of Gail's testimony that it had been there 20 straight days. And the house mother's testimony. Just, um, yes. In, in terms of the legal analysis of an unreasonably dangerous condition, make sure I understand. So setting aside the other case law, in this case, uh -huh. is your um, client's proof that this was an unreasonably dangerous condition, the fact that there was gravel and that she fell? Or is there, what, I guess, that there was gravel for 20 days and that she fell? Is there something else about it that makes it unreasonably dangerous? Sure. The fact that ABT had training materials about fall risks that fit this very setting, that it trained its people in, and that said, if you don't pick stuff up off the ground, people are going to fall on it, and it's going to be serious injuries, whether workers or patrons or, in this case, patients who have to be on it because ABT runs Willow House, took her there, and out she came to help. 
So, so yes, you're there's... saying the fact that they would say that generally patients that are inpatient at their facility shouldn't have things on the ground makes even a bit, I think you refer to it as a bit of gravel, a bit of gravel on a driveway makes that an unreasonable condition just because they have a protocol for not having items on the ground where patients would be walking? Is that the legal standard for what is unreasonable, an unreasonably dangerous condition? The only reason we're here is that all of those questions, Your Honor, are for a jury. Well, and I, and I hear you saying that, but certainly the case law says that a judge can um, create kind of those outer boundaries of what negligent is or isn't. So while it normally, and I think that's what the case law says, it's usually, it's normally a question for a jury, there's certainly case law that allows a superior court, trial court level judge to determine as a matter of law that this was not an unreasonably dangerous condition, correct? There is, and the case that they, they rely on for that uh, point is the, um, what's the name of it? It's Rogers v. Retrum. Judge Fidel wrote it. And that's the one where unreasonable was made by the trial court and upheld. But the facts there, there were, were no facts. The only thing that was the negligent act was the school um, system having an open campus law. So patient or student drives with other student, he goes 100 miles an hour, crashes the car, and they sue the school district for having, per se, hold this to be a wrong act, to have an open um, campus policy. And Judge Fidel went through, I mean, the whole opinion turns on there not having been any other facts other than the enactment of a policy. They didn't have any idea that the kid who was driving was a problem. There, they noted. Let's focus on this case. Huh? Why don't you go ahead and list for me to make sure I have the whole universe. What are the facts that were in the record that you believe establish a dispute of fact over unreasonably dangerous? Sure. Condition? You've mentioned the protocol. Okay. What What are the other facts you're relying on for that meeting that burden to get to the jury? Um, the protocols, the training materials. There were insurance materials that track their own training materials, and there are uh, national highway safety sidewalk standards and driveway standards, all of which say the same thing. Don't let stuff, gravel, stones, sand, leaves, accumulate because it's a fall risk. It wasn't time for expert testimony yet, but those will be the kinds of things that the experts on both sides have to deal with. Um, the other facts are, as you've noted, her lack of choice in the encounter. Well, how does lack of choice play in this case when she voluntarily got out of a car to assist with something that she was under no obligation to do? And I only raise that because you've said it now twice that she wasn't there of her own volition, as if, you know, I think it'd be a little bit different if it was the patient that they were walking out of the facility to get into the van, but this person was already secured in the van and didn't have any other obligation, and very quickly, because I don't want to take up too much time, but what, why is, the, how does that play into our analysis, her being there voluntarily? I mean, isn't she just an invitee, and that's the standard that we use to judge the behavior that, that defendant should have um, presented for her to be safe in their environment? What does the voluntary have to do with anything? If you were a patient and the pitch of ABT to people who are going to come to ABT or the people who are going to put them in, like Ms. Ager, they're going to take good care of you. The regulations of 
their regulatory agency was another piece of the evidence. They have to make sure that the grounds are safe for the patients. Now, counsel, yes. were the rocks visible uh, to your client? Could your client have just looked down and seen the rocks? We heard from defense counsel in the prior argument about a warning sign that gets your eyes up. You don't often look down well, as you're walking. If, but if you could answer my question, were they, were they open? Uh, could, could your client have just seen the rocks? She saw them after she had slipped on them when she was down on the ground. That, that, I accept that. That is a fact. Could she have seen them if she had looked? I'm assuming so. I mean, it's landscape grab. So the the likelihood of uh, your client being harmed if she had looked down was not great. If she looked down, which I don't know that there's a duty to walk and look when you're on a concrete driveway. There's You don't expect there to be any hazard in it. Well, we expect people to look where they're walking and to walk with eyes open and, and take care of themselves, don't we? Yes, Your Honor, but... And to when, kind of build on that, what are, what are you saying was the obligation of um, the location? Were they required to sweep daily, hourly? Did they have to have somebody out there watching? No, that would be, I mean, that would be what the experts say, which I imagine when they when they put the policy in, it was look for gravel and anytime you see it, get rid of it. I mean, it just, they didn't recognize, have the foresight to recognize the danger that it posed to their patients. So at the motion for summary judgment level, there was no standard of care evidence whatsoever by either party? Because there had been no experts identified. Okay, I'm just so, so no, the answer is no. There was no yes. standard of care. Okay. It, but it, you know, it obviously, as a premises case, doesn't turn like a med mal case would on the presence or absence of experts no, of entirely. Not. Um, Judge Perkins, to answer your questions, um, the other facts, the 20 days that it had been there was plenty of time to give notice to the land to the business. The historical case example of Sambo's having that very policy in place, finding and removing fall hazards 20 years before. Um, ABT's training materials, which we talked about, and Mr. Tormanson's, the driver's immediate reaction it didn't confuse him what had happened. Counsel, I'm, I'm still back to the point I brought up earlier in, in terms of whether this was an unreasonably dangerous uh, condition. And of course, it, the condition has to be not just dangerous, but unreasonably so. And in this case, it seems to me that, that well, you said earlier that if your client had looked down, she would have seen the gravel. So. Um, how does that impose this duty on the premises to sweep every so often, to have a, a sweeping program when uh, it doesn't appear that there was an, uh, that the dangerousness was unreasonably so because she could have simply looked at the gravel and walked around it? Your Honor, that's, jurors could make that decision. You would also hear jurors who would say, I'm not having to walk. It's not my job to, to make sure that a walkway doesn't have something that's going to trip me on it. And that... Jurors could decide that it's not a pedestrian's job to look where they're walking? Your Honor, that kind, the kind of looking that would identify gravel would be this. And would it? Very, would it? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's on, it, we showed you the pictures. It's not like black gravel on concrete. And there, you know, it's not river rock. 
you know, it's not an obvious hazard. That's why, you know, and, and uh, Judge McIntosh, that wasn't anything he discussed in his order. His order was solely about it's unreasonable. It's not, it's not unreasonably dangerous as a matter of law because there haven't been any prior falls. And I do want to touch on that because the case we gave you, Packmore, I mean, the absence of prior falls, that evidence used to not be even admissible ever. Under Packmore's regime, it's very unlikely it'll come in. As you read uh, in the, the case, where, for instance, plaintiff alleges that premises were negligently designed or maintained, the mere fact that no prior accidents have been reported is incomplete. It does not tell us how many near accidents, nor how many fortuitous escapes from injury may have occurred. And counsel, your time is up. So thank you very much for your argument. Mr. Thank Kiedis, you. when you're ready. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Kelly Jankaitis, and I represent the Appali A Better Today Recovery Services LLC that I'll refer to as ABT. I appreciate the opportunity to present argument today because I did not really appreciate what this case was about until I read the reply brief, which was, of course, after I had already submitted an answering brief. Um, and my answering brief is not completely useless, but I wanted to spend some time today talking about what I have thought about and ruminated on since I received the reply brief. The, rep the reply brief really focuses on, not on gravel so much as negligence and specifically duty. The gravel cases are all briefed on both sides and we can argue all day about the similarities and differences between those cases and this cases and this case. But the truth is that those cases are old. They're from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, which was surely before any of you were practicing law, and a long time before the Supreme Court blessed us with Gibson and Quiroz, um, which, which affirmed Gibson and expanded on what the actual examination of negligence should look like. Those cases represent a more precise approach to the principles of negligence than what was previously applied in these cases. And I think relying on those old cases using less precise standards, to me it appears the appellant is asking the court to take a step back from that precise application and apply an all facts and circumstances test for negligence. And there's a couple issues with that basic approach. The first one is that this isn't a case about negligence or liability. The issue here is duty, and duty is one part of negligence or liability, and it's separate from all the other parts. It's a narrow inquiry, and that is what makes those old cases harder to apply. Some of those issues are pointed out in the briefing, and they, um, the briefing talks about, well, they said that the premises owner wasn't negligent, but what they actually were looking at was the standard of care and stuff like that. So those cases are not really helpful when, when trying to figure out whether there was a duty in this case. A second issue with, uh, with appellant's theory that didn't come up in oral argument but it is in the brief is its reliance on the third restatement of torts. The, uh, the appellant describes that as the bread and butter of negligence in Arizona, but the Supreme Court does not agree with that. The, Third restatement formulation of duty was rejected in Kirill's. They spent almost 40 paragraphs talking about why that was the case. Um, so any reliance on the third restatement of torts is not founded in Arizona law. But the biggest problem with this approach is that, is that it's not precise. It conflates the issues of duty and standard of care, because you don't even get to defining what the standard of care is until you find that there's a duty. And it conflates duty with breach because you don't talk about what the defendant should have done until you figure out whether there was a duty to do anything in the first place. And it conflates duty with foreseeability, which has been rejected. 
And you'll recall that appellant argued today that the whole issue was that ABT had no foresight that this could have occurred. And that's a foreseeability approach to duty that's been rejected by the Arizona Supreme Court. And all of these principles are in Kira's. Kira says don't confuse duty with negligence generally. It says don't confuse duty with standard of care. It says don't confuse duty with foreseeability. You have to focus on just duty. And that's what's at issue here. The Superior Court found that there was no evidence upon which a reasonable jury could find that there was a duty because there was no evidence that this gravel created an unreasonable risk of harm. Now what's an unreasonable risk of harm? There's no precise definition or standard out there, um, but the concept may more easily be understood if you think about what's not unreasonable. And what's not unreasonable are open and obvious conditions. What's not unreasonable is situations where the plaintiff has an equal opportunity to observe and protect themselves against whatever the condition is. And that is what the evidence shows here. There's a lot of fluff in the record. To apply Kiro's, the court has to disregard evidence of foreseeability. The evidence of foreseeability, which should not go into a duty analysis, includes the appellant's status as someone who's likely to be on the property. So the appellant's reliance on the argument that she was in on involuntary treatment um, and was the type of person that would be coming here is a foreseeability factor and isn't relevant. The fact that the appellant hadn't been to the premises before or that the um, that ABT should have anticipated that there would be people who hadn't come before approaching it, approaching the condition for the first time, that's foreseeability and can't be considered. The fact that it's common knowledge, this is kind of the, the theory of the training materials and pamphlets that people can fall on surfaces um, is foreseeability. It's a foreseeability issue. And those materials say that people can fall on pretty much anything, even in a safe environment. Um, and then any evidence suggesting that ABT knew or should have known that there was gravel on the sidewalk is foreseeability evidence. Anything that's aimed at anticipating a risk of harm to another person is foreseeability evidence, and it's not used to consider duty under Arizona law. The other evidence that needs to be disregarded is any evidence that has to do with standard of care or breach, because those are separate issues. We're talking about duty, whether the condition was unreasonable, a la whether it was open and obvious. So any information about the mode of operation, which I'm using as a general term, that kind of theory has never been applied to a private landowner in Arizona before. It's always big box stores, corporations with um, bottom lines. Uh, but that information generally about how often they swept and when they swept and if they had a plan and all of that, that all has to do with breach. You don't get to that until you decide that there's a duty. Uh, the suggestion that sweeping was an easy fix also has to do with breach. That's something that would come into play after you found that there was a duty. Um, and then the other facts or evidence that the court should disregard when determining duty is inadmissible evidence. The evidence that ABT started sweeping regularly after this incident is a subsequent remedial measure that's not admissible to prove negligence in any way under the Arizona Rule of Evidence 407 um, and also wouldn't be relevant to duty anyway because it occurred after the duty was formed. Um, there's also a suggestion that gravel is dangerous only on hard surfaces. And there's no evidence in the record to support that assertion. And there's no evidence in the record to say that this gravel on this surface, this particular size of gravel on this particular flat concrete surface was dangerous. So that all has to be disregarded too. So what the court can consider in determining whether a reasonable juror could find that this was an unreasonably dangerous condition is that the appellant did not see the gravel. Well, appellant concedes that if she had seen, if she had looked, she could have seen the gravel. There's no evidence in the record that she did look. 
Um, and there is evidence in the record that other people who were on the property saw it. The van driver saw it, and the other patient saw it. So the only reasonable inference from this evidence is that if the plaintiff had looked, she would have seen it. Um, there's an aerial photo, which is not relevant to the conditions that the appellant faced on the ground, um, but does show that there's a contrast in color between the rocks and the sidewalk, suggesting that, again, if someone had looked, they would have been able to see it. There is evidence, there's an absence of evidence of prior falls. This is evidence that I, that I think is relevant. It's not great. Um, because there's a lot of reasons there could be no evidence of a prior fall. ABT is certainly not advocating a one bite rule or some sort of rule where duty depends on notice because that's foreseeability and foreseeability is not allowed in duty. But the fact that there isn't any other information out there or evidence that anyone has had any issue navigating this, this condition is evidence that it was not unreasonably dangerous. Um, the last piece of evidence is that the van driver said that it was unsafe. It's unclear what that um, opinion is based on. And when I was preparing for oral argument, it reminded me when I was in college, I shamed my boyfriend into going to a blood drive with me. And he looked completely stricken the entire time. And when I was giving him a hard time after it was over, he told me that the person who drew his blood, who presumably was a phlebotomist, had a name tag on that said van driver. <laughs> so I stopped giving him a hard time after that. Um, so it's unclear why the van driver or whether the van driver has any qualifications to declare the condition as unsafe. But appellant states in the opening brief in note five that the van driver recognized that condition was unsafe after the fall and stated in oral argument today that his feeling that it was unsafe was a reaction to the fall. And reactions and determinations that are made after the plaintiff encounters the condition are also not relevant to duty. So that's it. That's the evidence in the record. If the appellant had looked, she would have seen it. No one's ever had issues before. And the appellant did not look. This evidence is insufficient as a matter of law to establish an unreasonably dangerous condition or create a genuine material, genuine issue of material fact on which a reasonable jury could find otherwise. So there was no duty here. The plaintiff did not meet their burden of coming forward with evidence that a jury could find created a duty on ABT to take any action. We haven't defined the standard of care. Um, but there wasn't a duty to take any action in the first place. And that's why the case fails on summary judgment and why this court should affirm the summary judgment order. So we ask the court to affirm and to affirm the award of taxable costs, which is briefed adequately in the answering brief. Does anyone have any questions before I sit down? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your arguments. Council will take the matter under advisement and issue our decision in due course. The court stands in recess.